give it up for Mark de Clive Lowe. Thank you. Thank you. So you already see a, a bunch of equipment here, and you will see how that's being used later on tonight. But first up, we always do a little bit of history lesson, where you're coming from. You've been traveling the world quite a bit, not only as an artist, but also location-wise, you were born in New Zealand. I guess your musical career started off there. Was it also when you got that first spark where that said, that's the thing that I want to do? I want to work as a musician? Yeah, I think, um, like Dirk said, I grew up in New Zealand and I, I took piano lessons from a really young age. My dad just made me do, I had no choice. He just like, you will do this. So I did that and um, you know, grew up playing classical piano. I got into jazz and then through high school got very much into hip hop and, and later on electronic music. I don't think I ever thought about music as a career until I was in Japan. Um, I finished my high school in Japan and there's so much music there. It was incredible. Like Tokyo, you know, like Berlin, it's one of those global epicenters of culture and, and happenings. And comparing that to Auckland, New Zealand in 1992, there was just no comparison. So, you know, Tokyo kind of blew my mind and that made me decide, you know, this is the life I want. I want to be in music. How come you moved to London then? Um, London, I actually chased a girl to London was is the honest truth and um i've i mean I've, I've made several major moves around the world in my life and they've all had to do with, with women more than music so i'm very thankful to women in general for this opportunity um <laughs> i was um, lucky to travel the world for a year in 1997 on a like a travel grant where i got to go wherever i wanted to and just chase music so so I was in Cuba, the States, Europe, Japan. And it was then when I went to London, and I didn't really know what to expect. This, this girl was in London and we'd broken up already, so I really didn't know what I was doing there. And the flight back was too expensive. And the, yeah, you exactly, thought I might right? as well I was, stay here. I was stuck there um, with New Zealand dollars and uh, yeah, it wasn't good. But uh, it, was, it was kind of really fortuitous how things happened for me within a couple of weeks. I did a, as a keyboard player, I did session work for, for techno producer Dave Angel, and maybe two days later for Goldie's Metalheads label, and then maybe two days later with Phil Asher on a, like a more of a house music tip. But how did you get together? I mean, did um, it just happen like this? It just kind of happened. I mean, I mean, Dave Angel was a funny one because he saw me in Auckland, New Zealand, four years earlier. I was playing in some bar, and he walked in. I wasn't even playing. We were on a break, and he saw a Fender Rhodes electric, like a d electric piano there. And Dave is like, oh, is that yours? I said, yeah. He's like, oh, here's my number. Give me a call if you ever come to London. And he didn't even hear me play. So four years later, I'm in London. I have his number. I call him up. I'm like, oh, Dave, this is Mark. I'm that guy, um, you know. <laughs> and he didn't remember over the phone. But when we saw each other, he, he did remember. So just kind of, I mean, it was a nice fortuitous kind of meeting. And that was the only time we ever worked together. The music was cool. Um, and the Metalheads experience, similarly, that was really great. But it was meeting the West London community, which really Maybe you can changed my life. That was you can just explain what the West London community totally. was about. This is in the late 90s, early 2000s. There was a core community built around um, Four Hero, IG Culture, Phil Asher, Bugs in the Attic. And it was coming from a very eclectic kind of stance where you know, Four Hero came out of Reinforced Records, so there was, for them, it was, you know, jungle, drum and bass, rave music. Bugs were coming from a boogie and soul and funk background. IG Culture from a dub roots reggae background. Phil Asher from house music. And it was like all these people who were tired of making that music, and they wanted to evolve, and they wanted to make something new. So basically, by being misfits in their own communities, that's what, that's where they found solidarity together and created a sound together which later became, it was like the West London sound and then Broken Beat and had various names. Uh, essentially, it was, it was very eclectic music and it was beyond tempo, beyond genre. It was very tribal, very soulful. Um, and to me, today, it still really stands that test of time. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll hear, I'll hear in, a, in a house music set people dropping some of the classics from that time 
And it's, you know, it's a similar tempo, but it has a different energy. It's, it still sounds super fresh. And I guess a lot of the dubstep producers got influenced by totally. that era yeah. as well. Without what happened with Broken Beat, there'd be no dubstep, there'd be no grime. And there's a lot of music in America which wouldn't have happened either. I mean, I remember in the, in the early 2000s, we were hearing that all the Philly crew, you know, James Poyser, Quest Love, that they were all checking out what we were doing. And that was amazing to us because here we were listening to their music, being very inspired by that. So it was a real kind of, you know, give and take kind of two-way street in that way. How come you, uh, that scene drifted apart after some years? I mean, I, I guess everything, you know, everything comes to an end. Um, and I mean, for me, I came into it as a keyboard player and I left it as a producer, remixer and artist in my own right. So it was never about, you know, it was never about, you know, broken beat has to last forever and this is the be all and end all. It was just music, you know, it was just a time and place It wasn't a genre until the media gave it a name and called it a genre. And also it was a time when the industry changed. It went from analog to digital. And we had a lot of distributors who couldn't quite get their head around that. It was like, digital? Like, no, we're going to do 12s. And, you know, 12s died. Thank God they're coming back. But for that moment, everything changed and the, you know, the core distributors went down. A lot of artists and producers became disillusioned. It's like, well, why am I making this music if if there's no more records. You know, I'm not going to play MP3s. You know, this is pre-Serato. So it was a really interesting time. And I remember at that time having an attitude where I felt like this is going to separate, you know, the men from the mice. Like, if you are really in this and you really want to do this and you really love music, you're not about to stop. You know, just because the whole ass fell out of the industry. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was discouraging for a lot of people, but for me, It's always been about making music and having an opportunity to express myself through what I do. So nothing really changed in that respect. Well, you released your album, in, uh, your first international album, Tides Are Rising, in 1999. It was Six was Degrees. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Six Degrees, mm -hmm. Tides Are Rising was 2005. Um, so that's been 15 years. How would you say Ooh. your musical career has evolved over those 15 years? It's like a child. It's like, yeah, he's 15 now. It's like, what? crazy the parents here know what i mean but um for me that that record six degrees i, I spent this year in 1997 traveling the world and i got back to new zealand and i made a record which reflected those experiences and that was when you know like jazz and over had the fedim's flight and caravel um you know giles peterson was doing his bar rumba party i went to that one on my first night in london i went to that and i saw a club Basically, the way I saw it was a club full of beautiful girls dancing to Freddie Hubbard. That was incredible to me. For those who don't know, Freddie Hubbard was a jazz trumpet player. Giles was playing a tune of his called Gibraltar from like, I guess, the late 60s. And people were getting down. And it was loud, it was bassy, it was, you know, I'd never heard jazz in that context before. All those experiences got kind of compressed into into this one album where I got to you know, share with an audience how I felt about that year. I'd also started using, using an MPC for the first time. So I made the album just basically with a Rhodes, an MPC, and a JP8080, a Roland synth module. And fortunately, the album got picked up um, by Universal in the UK, and that facilitated me relocating there fully from New Zealand. And so now you've been in LA for the past five years. Why? Yeah, Another every, woman that everything had took to change. You, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I grew up in New Zealand, so sunshine, the ocean, quality of life, happy people. You know, these are all pretty important things to me. And London has some of these things in very small doses. So after a decade, it was time to, to get out of there. And, you know, I, I love to, you know, I, I love challenge and growth and opportunity. So one thing I'd always wanted to do since I was very young was live in America. Fortunately, this 10 years in London and touring Europe and stuff, it kind of formed me as an artist and a producer so that when I did finally get to go to America, I felt like I had something to say, like I had my own voice and could contribute through that. So Los Angeles became an opportunity five years ago. And I just thought, yeah, it's like summer, 10 months of the year and spring for the other two months. <laughs> It's kind of crazy. <laughs> um, and there's a, a really amazing music scene there. You know, Brain Feeder have their thing. 
um, when I got there, Sara were very active. You know, there's a whole hip hop side to it, a whole jazz side to it. There's a whole history there. You've got you know, Herbie Hancock, Harvey Mason, Patrice Rush, and all these kinds of people living there as well. So it's, it's a really great place to be. And um, well, you, as you said, you released your first big album on Universal. Then you, the one in 2005 was an Antipodian, right? Which was more, sel more or less self-released. Now you started a Kickstarter project. Maybe you can explain how that worked and your experience with that. Yeah, that's some, that's some brave new world stuff, Kickstarter. Um, I wanted to, to create my next album. And, you know, I can, I can easily sit in, you know, in a bedroom with a setup and make a record, but it wasn't really what I wanted to do as, a, as an artist at that point in time. So I did a, a fundraising campaign through the website Kickstarter. And it was really challenging. I mean, it's a very, very difficult thing to get someone to part with their money. You know, if you ask a friend for 10 euros, not all your friends are going to say yes. And those are friends, right? Yeah, it was definitely a challenge for me. But it went really well. It got funded beyond the goal and has facilitated me creating this new record, which comes out in about a month or two. Was it's it like a political campaign? It was actually, people said to me, this is like, this is like you are running for president. It's like, vote for me. And give me your money. And, and give me your money, <laughs> yeah. So, it, I mean, it's challenging. It's, it's interesting that the industry provides these opportunities now and that there are different ways to make a record, different ways to fund a career. And it's, I mean, it's just like a modern version of, of a patron. I mean, you know, you go, you go back to, to, the, to the Baroque era and stuff like that, and you had kings and queens paying artists to create music or paying Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel. And without these patrons, their art would never have happened. So it's kind of a democratized version of that to me. Would you recommend it to upcoming art artists? If you are open to the idea of failure and, you will, you will, and you'll work harder than you've ever worked before, I would. For those who are kind of analytically inclined, I'll tell you right now, I mean, I, I learned a lot about online statistics and metrics and stuff through this. 3% of your online fan base will probably support your project. And I mean, I'd like to think, you know, you look at Twitter or Facebook, it's like, you know, 11,000 people here, 10,000 people there. It's like, yeah, they're all going to support what I do. And I mean, people are interested. Like, you know, I follow people online and I'm interested in what they're doing. They have some new music out. I'm like, oh, yeah, let me check that out. But if they're saying, yo, can you buy my album now? I haven't made it yet, but can you buy it now? And for an inflated price even, it doesn't really, um, that doesn't correspond and correlate to a lot of people. But I did find, and looking at other people's Kickstarter and Indiegogo campaigns, you can count on 3% of your fan base to invest in you. So it takes a little while to get that number so you can at least um, count on the last 3%. Totally. I mean, if you have 100 people following you on Facebook and you only need $150 to make your album and three people give you 50 bucks each, then you're good. <laughs> yeah, why not give it a try? <laughs> so let's, t uh, let's talk about your musical setup. I mean, um, since this is going to be more of a remix workshop and uh, people want to see you, how you work all this gear, Maybe you can give us a quick rundown of what we are seeing here, or, and all of you guys will see through a little camera that we will project onto the wall. This is e effectively my, my live performance kind of setup. I do use it in studio, but it's, it's all about a live workflow and being able to capture the moment. For me, music is about little more than that. You know, capturing the moment and sharing it with, with other people. Um, I do work in the studio sometimes on Logic and, you know, clicking around and stuff, which I, I enjoy that to a point, but you'll see the way I work this is a very kind of tactile um, approach to making music. The new record, which was the Kickstarter project, is Church, and Church is the name of a nightclub, uh, like a club night I was doing in LA and New York for the last few years. And I, I call it a cross between a jazz club, a live remix experiment, and a dance party. For me, I mean, that's the story of my path. It's, it's through these genres that I've got come to my own conclusion of, of what, how I feel about music. So I wanted to share that experience over a club night. And we'd start it like a, like a jazz club, straight ahead jazz. And then I'd be sampling the musicians and remixing them live and then flipping it. Next thing you know, it's a full on electronic dance party. 
And the interesting thing was that we'd have people, we'd have the jazz heads come down early and check the jazz set, and they'd stay and they'd see it morph into this other thing, which they would never have seen otherwise. And then you had the dance heads coming down early and seeing some really twisted avant-garde jazz and seeing how that translates into the, the dance floor. So for me, that was a really cool thing to be able to share that, that kind of correlation between genres. I mean, I, I, I do feel like a lot of music today is way too stratified by, you know, it's kind of segregated by BPM and, and style where, I mean, for example, in, you, you couldn't tell me that rock music is a certain BPM. You couldn't tell me that country music is a certain BPM or classical music is a certain BPM. So for me, it was the same when it came to electronics, club music, dance music, sample-based music. You know, all, everything is, is possible. And it was a great kind of platform for me, to do, for me to do that. You think it would have been easier for you as an artist if you would have just connected to one genre instead of <laughs> so many? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if I'd done that, people could have been like, yeah, he's that guy who makes this. But that would have just driven me up the wall. You know, it's, it's really important for me to enjoy myself. If I'm, if I'm not enjoying myself, there's no point in doing any of this. It, it kind of takes me back to playing actually in jazz groups when I was much younger. And say you play it like you play a real up-tempo energetic tune, then the next tune you play wouldn't be an up-tempo energetic tune. It just wouldn't be. And if you tried to say, let's do this, then someone else in the band would say, no, we just did that. Let's play this other kind of thing. And by that, you got a dynamic of different tempos and moods and feelings. And, you know, for me, tempo BPM is just a color. And, you know, why would I want to paint in one color? You know, it's just, it's just not an option to me. At the same time, you know, I, I, I've got a really deep love for, for so much music. And I have no issue with anyone sticking to their, their, their style or their thing. But what I do think is important, and I was reminded of this when I was working with, with jungle guys, people like Lemon D and Dillinger, they used to laugh how, like the kids at the time, they see kids coming through making drum and bass. And the whole joke to them was that all these kids listened to was drum and bass. You know, they wake up, drum and bass, have lunch, drum and bass, have dinner, drum and bass, and then go and make some drum and bass. Now, Kevin D and Dillinger didn't listen to drum and bass. It just wasn't, it wouldn't occur to them to listen to that music. You know, they make that because it's the, it's the sum total and, total and end result of their experiences listening to other music and experiencing other music. So that was a really important thing that I, I've always kind of held true to and I like to encourage people, you know, whatever you're into, try and get into some other shit as well, you know. All right, now we got the camera set up. So you can give us a rundown of what Yay. we are actually seeing and will be hearing in a second. Yeah. Okay, so the setup here, like I said before, is basically what I like to use in a live situation. It's hosted in Ableton. When I'm playing with a band, and um, sometimes I'll have the setup with a live band and I'll have a machine running in standalone mode. If I'm doing a solo set where I like to remix and use a cappella source material, I'll have machine hosted in Ableton and the acapella is also in Ableton. The setup is, I mean, there's a lot of gear here, but it's, it's pretty simple. I think of it as two turntables. Machine is one turntable. It goes through a chaos pad. And then the acapellas, or the source material, are the other turntable, and they go through a chaos pad too. I've got two chaos pads linked together here for one of the channels. The keyboard is basically triggering whatever sounds are active on machine. Okay, so with machine, I have, I don't know if anyone here has used machine, but it's, you know, it's a USB controller, drum machine setup. I grew up using an MPC, so it's not too different from that, um, but it ov obviously offers a lot more breadth um, because it's, you know, it's only limited by the computer and the processing power there. So machine, I have banks of drums, basically, one-shot drums. So everything is one shot, like there's no loops going on. Um, then I have a bank of synths, basses, and then some keyboards, different synths. So whatever pad I touch on the machine is live over here. So say 
this clap. That's mapped across the keyboard. Generally, if it's drum sounds, I'll program them on machine, but I'll use the keyboard for the more you know, melodic or harmonic sounds and bass sounds. So when I do a gig, when I do a live show, and it's quite similar to if I'm in the studio with a setup, there's nothing in the machine as far as programming goes. If I press play, that's all you're gonna hear. And you know, that's, that's instead of a metronome, metronome and as a necessity so I can hear the tempo. But it's, I love the idea where, you know, you see guys with a laptop on stage and Ableton or whatever they're using, and there's actually not a lot going on. And I would, if, you, if any of you do this, I challenge you to challenge yourselves with these setups. If I'm running Ableton and I'm kind of selecting a clip, you know, filtering it, fading it, next clip, but everything is pre-created, there's not a lot of risk there. I would even go so far as to say a lot of people who do that do the same thing every time they play. They might filter it a bit differently or change it a bit, but there's not a lot of variation. For me, live music, whether it's electronic or acoustic, is about risk more than anything. That's all I want to see. And yeah, you know, different people require different things when they see a live show, but I love, I love the idea that everything could go wrong at that second, but it's the artistry, musicianship, and that moment that hold it all together. You know, free jazz is, is a great example of that at an extreme where it's really cacophonous and seemingly random, but there's kind of a cohesion in it all. At the other end, you know, when I, I saw D'Angelo's Voodoo Tour in 2001, and it was a super tight band, super rehearsed, but you could feel all the risk going on. Like there was, it wasn't like, let's play the CD like note for note. It was, it was a whole experience. So for me, whatever you're doing, that's important. And this rig has enabled me to, to be like that. So what I'll pretty much do is just start it off and hit record on machine and just start hitting pads. So just by messing around, you know, you get a, there's a groove happening. The chaos pad is running different effects. So there's reverbs, filters, whatever comes out machine is going through there. So um, let me demonstrate that briefly here. There's a high pass filter, low pass filter, reverbs, delays. Um, like a kind of a granulator effect, a looper, and distortion, and an LFO, which is, I'll probably use that on a different sound in a minute to show that. Um, I love the Chaos Pad because it's tactile. You know, I could sit here, on here, I could have a mouse, but there's something about touching things and it just, it makes it all more real for me. The chaos pads can also sample, so I'm gonna sample the machine into the chaos pad now. So now what you're hearing is in the chaos pad here.
So now with a with a four bar loop, that's all that's all that is, I'm given a lot of organic opportunity through the chaos paths primarily. I can create kind of pseudo fills and little loops and glitches and you know give it an organicness while it still has the weight and sonics of electronics. <laughs> So you can kind of hear how I can effectively create a mix. You know, I can create two records, blend them together, and it's it's not dissimilar to the whole idea of, you know, I'm I'm DJing, but I'm not playing you records. I'm I'm making you records. The beauty of that is when it's a club environment or it's a band environment, whatever's happening in that moment, I can react to you know very instantly. What the great thing about this for me is that I can, you know, very quickly, whatever's in my head, I can create, or I can experiment. And sometimes that comes from resampling. Where I mean, we used to do this a lot with the, um, yeah, with samplers before it was all computers. You'd sample something, and you'd kind of mess with it, and you resample it, and you mess with it, and you resample it, and you end up down the line with a whole different texture. I I love that whole aspect of the music where things can become unexpectedly something else. I'm going to use an acapella. It's a Bob Sinclair joint that is, um, Dirk mentioned this remix competition that's going on. It's one of the tracks from that competition. In fact, let me, let me play you the track briefly, the original track. Um, and whoever is interested, they can, you can all download the parts for that remix and participate as well. And so Mark it's, uh, was happy enough to demonstrate that. There's another track by Luciano and the other one was, I think, DJ Fly. Yeah. So this is Outro Luga, Salom de Bahia, which Bob Sinclair produced.
So that's the original track that we're talking about. You know, a lot of you would have heard that. It's a cover. Um, it's, a, it's a very famous tune. It's a great tune. It's a, yeah. So the question is what to do with it in a remix context. I have the a cappella, um, which should be here. La 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 la. I have a launch pad here just to trigger the, trigger the clips. Um, I've got the horn part. So that's all I'm really using here. And I guess basically using the technique I just talked about with the machine, let me just put that all together and see what happens. I don't really have a predetermined idea of what I'm going to do. All I'm going to do firstly is maintain pretty much the original tempo and see what you know, how I interpret that vocal and the musical idea of it at that tempo.
Thank you. Mark, so it's fairly easy to say, um, play live, do your thing, risk something. Yeah. I guess you started out at one stage as well. Was so? Did you sometimes have a backup plan just in case you? Were yeah, completely I definitely. Ruined? Man, I yeah. <laughs> um, when I started touring my own projects, I had an MPC. It was a kind of a core part of the band, and I would pre-program everything. So every beat of the gig was already in the MPC. I might change pattern. I might mute the kick drum, but there was nothing too adventurous. It was also at a time I was more about playing the keyboard. And so I didn't realize how to translate that thing to this thing. I did a show in Budapest um, about 10 years ago, and we did the encore in the set. So the funny thing was that after we finished, the audience wanted more, and I had no more. I was like, I was saying to the promoter, I was like, no, nah, man, you know, I'm, I'm tired. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to fake it out, and the promoter made me go on stage. And I looked at the MPC 3000, and I was like, oh, shit, I got to I'm gonna make a beat. So I went over and put it into record mode, and it was scary. I mean, it was one of the more scary things I've done. Live television is probably as scary. That's about it. But just the idea that, you know, whatever I hit is on this huge system. There's probably, you know, a thousand, two thousand kind of size room. And so whatever I do would be audible to everybody. And I had no idea what I was gonna do. So I kind of stumbled around the MPC and made this kind of a beat, I guess. Um, and I remember it not making sense to me, and I had to construct the bass line and the music to make sense of the beat, which was a fun exercise, I guess. But more to the point was, it, it reminded me in that moment of growing up playing jazz music, improvising and being in the moment and being at risk, not knowing what was gonna happen. And from then on, I, ne I never pre-programmed another beat. It just became, you know, let me, let me make every gig for that moment, it's like, you know, if you come to a gig of mine, you've all taken the time and effort to come and see me. The least I can do is give you something very special that is how I feel about that moment, the energy you all bring to the room, what I have for dinner, how nice my hotel room is, you know, all these things, or how bad my hotel room is, whatever it is, all these things contribute to the experience of a day. So all those promoters watch out for where to book him in and what to give him for dinner. No, there'll be some guy be like, yeah, okay, we'll put him in a really cheap room, give him a really crap meal, and wait till you hear the music, it'll be amazing. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was just gonna ask, um, how much time do you have to spend on pre-mixing or, or levels or effects and things to make sure that your sounds are gonna sort of fit and sound good on a system? One of the main things is, obviously when you're playing records, you know that they're gonna sound good. Uh, um, totally. And sometimes you can spend hours and hours actually just mixing a track in mm -hmm. itself, so if you're doing it live, one of the fears I guess sort of have is, how do you know it's going to actually sound good and mixed? Um, it's a good question, and I, the, the short answer is I don't. Um, but more literally is, you know, I'll do a sound check. Um, I don't spend a lot of time at sound check these days. I used to spend more. But I find that also, you know, every room sound feels different. And it's weird because you play, a, you play the same record in different rooms, and it will sound effectively the same mix. Sonically, it might be a little different, but, you know, the... What if the string is going to be the same volume. For some reason in this rig, that's, that rule doesn't hold true. I don't know why. So it might be that I'm using you know, a, a synth sound, it's not cutting through, so I'll just turn it up while I'm using it. Or something's too loud, I'll turn it down while I'm using it. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of this kind of setup. Um, Machine Studio, which I use in the studio, has a full mixer, mixer display, which makes that a whole lot easier. It's a little more finicky on this, but it's still possible. Um, that said, I've, I've, I've definitely had some gigs where it just, yeah, the sound hasn't worked. That's part of the, the risk. The bigger challenge for me is actually when I'm working with the live band as well, especially if there's a live drummer, and it's not my sound man at some festival, and he's, he sees drums and what they call track. Usually, you put track behind the drummer. You know, pop music, a lot of music, that's just what you do. And I always have a note on my tech stuff saying, you know, the track's in front of the drummer. When I have a live drummer, I want them to be the live break that's inside the shit, not the opposite way around. That's out of my control sometimes. You do a festival, you, s you have 15 minutes to set up, you do a line check, you play. I never get to walk out front and hear the sound. 
you know, I, I had someone tweet me after a, fest a huge festival, and it was like, I mean, it was 140 characters, but I'm going to say it longer. But it was kind of like, you know, I, I was so let down by one of my heroes today at MDCL, sonically, it was rubbish. That's basically what he said. And, you know, that hurt a little bit, because <laughs> on stage it sounded great. Our monitors sounded great, but, you know, you can't account for what's going out the front when you have a live situation. It could happen with a live band, too. You have a live band with a string, with a, a violin player, chances are you're not going to be here the violin player or just weird stuff like that fortunately most of this is in my control and in a club setting i have complete control you know, turn the booth off listen to the room the same way when you're djing it's like you know are the, are the lows too too low or too high or the highs too high or too low that's the same thing have you ever played a gig in barcelona no <laughs> have you ever played a gig where you feel out of place yes where was that? Um, it, at at Tolzin last night. <laughs> How was that? Um, I'm on tour actually with a young man at the back of the room, Miley Manzanza, great drummer and producer. Um, and we did this gig at, at Tolzin. And some of you know the place. I think, is that how you pronounce it? Bar Tolzin. Bar Tolzin. It's kind of bougie. And it's, you know, this would have been the place to do the gig. But you would have preferred Boogie, right? Yeah, yeah, boogie, boogie over bougie, definitely. But you know, you just do, your, you just do what you're doing. Huh? What more can you do? I mean, it's the same when I'm DJing. I was in Hong Kong. Actually, I wasn't even DJing. I was doing this in a club, and this chick walks up to me. I'm about to start. All this equipment's here. She walks up to me with her iPod, which is weird. Her iPod, and she's going like this in my face. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, speak. She just keeps doing this. I'm like, okay, she wants me to look at her iPod. So I take her iPod. I'm like, what? And she's kind of pointing to it. And I don't have much patience at this point in time. You know, this is not, there's something about the culture today where this is acceptable. And it wasn't acceptable before. You know, you couldn't be, you couldn't be at the Hacienda or Paradise or anywhere and go up to the DJ and say, yo, can you play my tune? It's not about that. You know, the DJ is there to take you on a journey. That's all it's about. And I mean, the funny thing is, is that this should be second nature to everybody. It's not even applause worthy. Honestly, like to have the, the nerve to, to go up to a DJ, unless he's playing top 40, that's different. You know, he's playing Rihanna and you want to hear Drake? Fine, I understand that. But in any other circumstance, it's not acceptable. So, you know, this girl's there and I'm like, look, if you want to hear your iPod, go and get your headphones and fucking listen to your iPod. And she looked at me like I was the devil. It was just, it was bizarre. So that kind of set the tone. I'm, I haven't forgotten your question. That set the tone for this event. You know, I was in this club and she represented the people in the club. So I felt like, wow, I'm in this place where people have no idea why I'm here and they have the nerve to think they can ask me to play their iPods. So the DJ before me was spinning. I stopped the music, grabbed the microphone, and I told the whole club what just happened. I told them it was totally unacceptable. And, you know, short of telling her to get out, I didn't do that. <laughs> but that was pretty much the spirit of what I was saying. You know, if you don't like it, leave. And that's kind of how I feel about being in somewhere where I'm uncomfortable. It's like, be comfortable. <laughs> you guys want to hear another remix of that song? Shakira. 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 Some Shakira? What? Who said Shakira? Get out. Shakira. <laughs> you got Miley Cyrus? Um, so let me just, I want to take the same source material and look at it a different way. Just to demonstrate a whole different way of looking at it. It's a different tempo, different kind of vibe. Um, and again, I've, I've chosen the tempo, but I don't know what is going to come out.
thing for me with this is it's fun you know it's like if it's not fun what's what's the point point? and to all the ladies out there you are the living proof that multitasking in men is possible <laughs> the ir the ironic thing is that i'm i believe it's not so <laughs> but it's I but mean, it's only it, what you tell your if, wife right? if you if you watch a drummer play you know, it's like two feet two hands doing all this different shit you watch a tabla player play there's ten fingers doing different shit 
it's kind of amazing what's possible. You know, you watch a, you watch a blind person do something, it's, you know, but what, I think, I feel like we're kind of a bit conditioned in this day and age to think we're capable of less than what we are. And um, for me, you know, people look at this and like, oh my God, that's incredible. My usual reply is, it's not rocket science and it's not brain surgery. You know, those are things I cannot do. So if you, my, you know, what's most important for me to impart to anyone here who makes music is to challenge yourself. Like whatever you, however you make your music, challenge yourself to make it another way. Oh, I can't, I can't play a keyboard. Well, just start playing the keyboard. I can't play guitar. Start playing guitar. You know, I, I can only use samples. I can't make my own music. Just start making your own music. And I tell you, you will suck at first. You know, I promise you that Michael Jordan was not slam dunking the first time on a basketball court. It wasn't happening. You know, it takes time, practice, and there's a lot of craft. And um, for me, yeah, honoring the craft is a very important thing. Whatever your thing is, graphic design, music, law, you've got to, you know, honor what you do to take it beyond what you think you can do. What do you do when you're in that valley and you're looking for motivation? What keeps you motivated? Um, I'm lucky that I am pretty self-motivated, but I have been in that situation. You know, I've had writer's block, where I just can't come up with anything that I think sounds any good. Um, I'm like, why am I doing this? You know, should I have gone to law school? Or, you know, I've, I've had those times in my life. And I feel like, you know, you've got to support yourself with, I mean, s surround yourself with people who are like-minded and you all encourage each other to keep going. You know, everyone has these moments of doubt. And I, I feel like the, a, mo a real moment, a moment of doubt and a crisis of faith is a good sign that you're on the right track. You know, if you never have that moment, then you're either really stupid or you're not, doing, you're not challenging yourself. You know? So, yeah, I, think, I feel like people around you lift you up. Could you des Any question? describe the moment when you had no going back? <laughs> when you felt that... Music was all. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you mean voc as a career? Life. Right, in any way. I mean, music was always a very important thing to me. It was always around me. It was a natural part of my day. Just from my, you know, my dad liking 30s big band music to my older brother liking whatever he liked. And, you know, he liked Sade and the Style Council, I think. And my other brother liked the Smiths and... You know, music was just a normal part of life. So in that respect, there was never any question. Um, but I had, I had, a, I had one moment I remember very specifically was I finished high school in Japan. I went back to New Zealand and I was signed up for law school. That was going to be it. And I remember I was living at home at my parents' house on the first day of university. I kind of woke up and just thought, no, <laughs> that's not it. I'm going back to sleep. And so, you know, my dad's knocking on the bedroom door. He's like, Mark, Mark, it's the first day of university today. Get up. Uh, I'm not going. And that was that. You know, it was, it was as simple as that. And for months after that, as I'm sure those of you with loving parents can relate, I would go in the kitchen and my mum would have already got the newspaper and circled any job she thought might be relevant to my, whatever my skill set was. I was like, Mom, I'm not going to do it. You know, she, they, they, my parents did not understand the notion of what I was saying. I did actually end up working in corporate for three months in New Zealand when I was 21 years old. And that was crazy. There was like people in the office found out I liked music. They'd pop into my office and be like, oh, I heard this great band at the pub last night. Have you, have you heard that Dire Straits track? It was just all this stuff where it was alien to me, and I, I, I knew that wasn't where I belonged. So I think there was a sense of belonging whenever I was doing what I was doing, and a real sense of uncomfortableness when I wasn't. So that's how I knew. There was no question that this was going to be the path and the career path and how, I, how I'd earn a living. And it's, it was never about chasing the money either. You know, I'm a, a huge believer in... You, know, you follow your dream, you commit to your dream, you execute your dream, and the money will come. Like the means to survive, the, you know, the world will provide that. Could you describe a moment of doubt? <laughs> You're really pushing me like, <laughs> show us your dark place. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was in, I, 
you know, Lon London is a pretty dark place. For the, anyone who's lived there can relate. And I got, I got beat down in London. I got to a point where I, I felt everything I made was a pastiche of myself. Like it just didn't, I was like, where's, you know, where's the new shit? It just wasn't coming out. And I think I was in a pretty weird relationship with this, with this girl and that wasn't happening. Like nothing was happening. I was probably smoking way too much weed, which just doesn't help that headspace at all. We all do at some point. There you go. <laughs> so exactly, and it was that point. It was that point. And I had, a, I had a, a producer friend of mine. A producer friend of mine called me up, and you know, he knew I was in this headspace. And he's, he's very successful, and he's, like, he's older than me, somewhat of a mentor. He's like, man, come to the studio. I've got a session for you. So I went to a studio feeling like, I was worthless and you know I played some keys on this drums he had and we made a track the track was terrible it was so bad and he was, he wrote me a check on the spot he gave me he paid me for that session and that session was not worth the paper the check was written on like I gave him nothing but this is it was kind of like a, a, a Yoda Jedi training moment you know he was like showing me you know this is what you do you know, you, you turn up, you do what you do, and you will get rewarded. You know, he was a, he's a man of very few words, so it was, that was how he showed me that. So those, those kind of darker moments have happened, and I think that all contributes to the, your, your character and who you are and your experiences in this world. Um, and, you know, it, it hasn't always been amazing. I mean, it's not, a, it's not always amazing now. I'll get a few months where I'm just not working. Then I'll get a few months where I'm working so much that I'm, I'm making the rent or the mortgage and getting paid. And then, you know, my family's pissed off because I'm working too much. You know, there's always life. That's just part of doing what we do. If you were, I don't know why lawyers keep coming up. If you were a lawyer and you were very successful, you'd have these same issues. You'd have so much money, but maybe you're dealing with criminal cases who are the darkest people doing the darkest shit and you're never at home and when you are at home you're bringing that baggage home and I don't know you know like whatever you know walk your walkers in this life you will have those challenges please give a big thank you to Mark to Clive Lowe yeah. well, thank you thank you